So if you go somewhere and you ask, what is the number of the beast, at least in the United States of America, but I would guess around most of the world, the answer is 666. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. There is a word for the fear of the number 666. I had to write it out phonetically. I'm going to try it here. Hexacosioi hex econta hexaphobia. Jesus Christ. That is a word for people who are scared of the number. I'm not scared of the number anymore. And since this is episode 666, and I'm no longer scared of Satanists, I thought I would have some Satanists on the broadcast. And I want to welcome my very special guest. I've got Shalice. By the way, Shalice Blythe, you are, what's your title with the Satanic Temple? What do you do? I've got quite a few. Uh, uh, Minister of Satan, uh, also a media relations specialist, and I'm also the programming director for our SatanCon annual event. My buddy, Aaron Ra, I know you're a Satanist. You're not an official representative of TST, but you do now identify as a Satanist. Is that right? I joined the Satanic Temple uh, shortly after my state started criminalizing or attempting to criminalize abortions ahead of the uh, the, the Supreme Activist Court. Texas. Because, yeah. It, it, not only do I agree with the seven tenets you know that the uh the the satanic temple posts i mean i agree with that they're certainly better than the 10 commandments but i wanted to show support for the organization for their activism in defense of the first amendment which is what i'm all about well you go. you've got the look you've got that gothic sort of uh people who i was don't a neo-pagan occultist so i was close enough people who n <laughs> don't know that you are the biggest teddy bear in the universe you know, you do cut an imposing figure. Also, a co-founder of the Satanic Temple is uh, joining us, my friend Lucian Greaves. Hey, brother, good to have you back. Hey, good to be here. Thank you. So have you ever been at a convenience store or somewhere and maybe somebody rings up a coffee in a candy bar and the receipt says 666 or it says that on the register? And you ever seen somebody wig out and like go b grab a pack of gum because the number itself bothers them? I've seen it. I'm just curious if any of you encountered this phenomena? Well, I am originally from Utah, so I've seen it. I've I've seen it plenty of times. Yep. Utah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Satanism must uh, really go over there. Of course, I I think there's an underground in Utah in Mormon country of people that are doing all kinds of quote unquote evil deeds when the church isn't watching. It's a repression culture, right? And repression cultures never work. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, the the subversive culture is really strong in Utah. It just kind of depends on the little pack, uh, little pockets. But for the most part, when you uh, are living in a state that is heavily um, one sided when it comes to a religious uh, uh, identity, um, yeah, you're you're going to breed a lot of counterculture. So yeah, there's there's a lot of it out there. Lucian, you ever seen anybody just flip out six 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 and like, eh, and they literally have a moment? Well, it's it's been so long since I. Uh since I actually did a checkout, I think, where a cash, I actually had to deal <laughs> with a cashier and not just a self-checkout or Instacart. Um, you'd be amazed how little I went, I, I have gone out into the public since, since COVID even started. It's not even about fear of disease anymore. It's just about not wanting to be around people. But you really bring up an interesting point about the repression culture and how to a certain degree, or maybe to the majority degree, the, uh, the nature of the repression kind of dictates the nature of the countercultures and these become self-fulfilling prophecies when they uh, create satanic panics in the like they they create then uh, villains who people who are willing to contextualize themselves as the beasts that they feel they've been uh, they've been categorized as by the broader society around them and we saw that during the 80s and 90s and I think one thing that pisses people off about the satanic temple more than anything else is that 
we self-identify on our own terms and don't play the game of trying to appear as the monsters they want us to be, um, but is still insisting that that's what we are. I did a story recently about the, the prohibition on alcohol 100 plus years ago. All right, we're going to make it illegal. We're going to keep people from doing it in the name of morality. And instead, the entire culture sort of went underground and people found a way. And not only was it ineffective, but it was actually harmful because now you weren't getting revenue dollars or tax dollars and people were starting to make their own hooch. And sometimes it contained toxins, which either harmed or killed them. And there were all kinds of side effects. And at the end of the day, 10 years, they just pulled the plug on prohibition and said, whoops, that didn't work. And that seems to be the case with so much. We see the Bible Belt states, they're usually the highest in all kinds of things, whether it's teen pregnancy or porn use. I think, she, you know, Utah, right? I think Utah is either one or two in porn use these days. I don't know. It is, yeah. Well, and, you know, kind of, I, I think the overall theme is if Satan you make us, then Satan we shall be. And so whether that's people who identify as Satanists or they, you know, identify with any other counterculture, um, whether, you know, it's a social counterculture or anything like that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy and people eventually just embrace the identities of which is bestowed upon them or something that they're just like, well, all right. If that's what you want me to be, then fuck it. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to turn it up to 11. Yeah. My Warren understanding Rob, goes that Utah ahead, was though. number one in porn and then mm -hmm. Shalice left. Yep. Yep. And now it's down to what? Six? <laughs> yeah. Or 50. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean now, to walk on is, you there. There's a little bit of a delay. Aaron Raw, go ahead, brother. Uh, my, my thought is on the on porn use in Utah. If you live in Utah and you don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle and the money to go play with one, then what else is there to do? <laughs> well, uh, that's a whole other show. I'm sorry. I always wondered if those endowment ceremonies really did get kind of freaky. Everybody's already dressed in the sheet. Being in Texas, Governor Abbott, Aaron Raw. Holy shit. I thought I had it bad with Kevin Stitt in Oklahoma, who just dedicated the entire goddamn state of Oklahoma to Jesus. He had a prayer right after the 2022 election. He wins overwhelmingly, and the first thing he does is he has a prayer, a public prayer, and he dedicates the whole state to Jesus. Abbott does the same stuff down there, right? Abbott is is disastrous. I I'm, I feel so bad. I, I was with uh, Wendy Davis. I was at her uh, at at her convention where she was running against Abbott, and uh, we we were there when she had to make the concession that he had won. We we canvassed for her because. Yeah, we, we thought that Wendy Davis was a heroic figure. Who it, what, what she's famous for is that she had herself fitted with a catheter so that she wouldn't have to take restroom breaks while she used a filibuster to beat back the anti-abortion legislation that Texas was trying to pass back in 2011, I think it was. Uh, and she was a hero. I mean, what, what, what she did in order to save our rights was literally heroic. And uh, it, I I was so moved, and, and it, it was it was an internet phenomenon what was going on with her. And so when she ran for governor, we were supportive. We we did interviews with her a couple of times, and uh, it was it was so sad to see Abbott beat her for the governor's race. And it it's pathetic in this state that no one seems to learn the lessons. They get Abbott, and they're after Perry, after Bush. It's like this state can't learn. This no, state no, no. can't figure out, hey, this was a mistake. This was another mistake. We'll follow that with another mistake. We'll we live in a culture where people things. people elect Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like I thought the first time I'm like, all right, well, she was unopposed. And this is a sort of a freaky, you know, this is just an anomaly. And the fact that she was not reelected and then appointed to what? Homeland Security, that committee. And I just I feel like we're circling the drain. I'll bounce it back to you, Lucian. You want to talk about uh, this? Because talk Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, et cetera, they're all satanic panickers, right? Right. Yeah. And, and that's a that that's a really worrisome development when people really start taking these irrational ideas seriously uh, and they get out into to mainstream culture and people become more activated because you hear them claiming things about us that if they were true would justify severe action against us. The Pedophiles idea that and that kind of thing, you mean? 
Right, right. And, you know, we get those kinds of messages where people say they're going to act upon those vigilante impulses and, and everything else. And I, and I do think the rhetoric more and more is ramping up to inevitable violence. And I'm just really discouraged that it seems like on the extreme ends of the political spectrum, people just can't get enough of their dictators. They they want them, you know. And I was horrified when I was recently watching a lecture on YouTube. Uh, a scholar was talking about Mao. And, you know, to me, Mao is neither left wing nor right wing and, you know, neither conservative nor liberal. A, a dictator is a dictator. It's all pretext for centralizing power for their own agenda, whatever it whatever it is, according to their whim. And that's how they behave. But to see during the Q&A, somebody raise their hand and dress the scholar down for not talking about the offenses committed by the U.S. and their foreign policy and things like that, and suggesting that because the U.S. has made numerous unforgivable missteps, that we would be just as well under Mao, who was sending all his food to other countries to try to enlist them into a World War III in which he would come out the top leader, uh, to the point where citizens were starving by the million. To pretend that that's no worse than where we are now is a very disturbing mindset to me. And I feel like with the extreme polarization we're dealing with now, it's that all or nothing mentality from the polarized segments. And I just begin to feel that in the same way that people do not seem to learn in, in Texas, in the same way we keep uh, progressively electing in these less and less competent, less and less rational, less and less coherent politicians, that it seems like humanity just needs to run these cycles again and again. And we have to go through a period of autocracy before people wake up and realize that that's not the optimal way to live. And I really hope that's not the way of it, but I've been feeling pessimistic of late. And I I, I honestly think Satanism, our, identif our identification as Satanists, our our fight for these principles where we try to get people to exercise bl blind neutrality. You don't have to like what we look like. You don't even like have to like what we say, but you set even legal parameters that everybody follows, including us, and you set that aside. I think that's become so lost and it's becoming lost more and more on the left as it's been lost for so long on the right. And that's what's, that's what's really just distressing to me is, both sides driving each other's extremism to the point where I feel like we we have an inevitable showdown with with dictatorship. Shalice, you want to weigh in on any of what we've been talking about? Well, I mean, I I don't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, and uh, you know what we what we have constantly run up against is this idea that you know the reason there is this such support for um, you know people in positions of authority that want to wield that as a as a weapon against uh, the minority is that people don't realize is that that has a larger effect. Um, that's a larger impact. Eventually, it will hit home with them. You know, it's, it's like uh, you see these you see these political um, commentators like the Ben Shapiro's and things who, you know, considering we are living in an era of not only satanic panic, but, you know, now we're seeing a, a rise in anti-Semitism, not only with politicians, but now pop stars and, and, and things like that. So people using their platforms to push uh, these rhetorics is that, um, you know, people like the Ben Shapiro's who do identify uh, as being a part of the the, the people who are currently uh, at the center of the rhetoric. Um, but, you know, it, as long as they stay on the side of those who are in the power of, of oppression, they think that they're going to be um, they're going to be, uh, you know, seen as the good ones. Therefore, they're not going to be subject to the consequences of the of the actions. But what they don't realize is that they're going to be sharing the same jail cell with the rest of us. It, it'll just hit them last. So it's that it's that um, complete disconnection of thinking that so long as I uh, stand next to the oppressor, um, I will be I will be safe from my eventual uh, imprisonment because I still am a part of that, uh, that demographic that is currently, um, you know, being, uh, uh, oppressed. So yeah, no, I mean, we've, we've seen it all the time. This is just basic human history and it's just unfolding on, on this scale. And yeah, it's, it's not just going to be Satanists. It's almost like they're saying, Hey, I'd rather be a pet than cattle. 
right? Yeah, basically. I mean, yeah. yeah. But, you know, they'll put the cat down too. Yeah. yeah. I would imagine how my my family reacted when I didn't, when I announced that, that I've now joined the Satanic Temple because I've already been hearing from my family people that tell me that, you know, that the, the right wing conservative Christian nationalist authoritarians who vote constantly vote against their own interests, completely oblivious to the fact that that is what they're doing. Right. And they want to say that it's an it's a dichotomous us versus them kind of mentality where everything is binary and where every every leftist must everybody who's not an extreme right wing authoritarian must be a radical leftist. And every everyone who ever voted Democrat is a pedophile devil worshiper. And I I, I asked I asked my own mother, I said, do you, you really believe that Tom Hanks drinks raped baby's blood while he worships the devil? And her answer was, you can't prove he doesn't. What do you do with that? No, I, I, we're circling the drain. Uh, like, I'm an optimistic guy, but <laughs> the last few years have revealed my own naivety. I, you know, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I've been deluded and kidding myself. Uh, I want to bounce out of politics. I, that's kind of a deeper dive that we may return to. Good I'm luck interested with that. <laughs> in the kind of... The kind of cartoonish Satan that many of these people are so afraid of, you know, the red skin and the horns and, you know, it looks like a very naughty hell boy. Does anyone, has anyone gotten into like the origins of our perception of Satan, where that comes from? Can anyone speak to that? Go ahead, Aaron. You guys see your hand. Go ahead. I I don't want to I don't want to upstage Lucian, you know. But I mean, yeah, I did a, I did a speech on this in your state, in Oklahoma City. I did a speech called "Give the Devil of Stew," where I talked about the origins of Satan and Angraman Yu and uh, Hashatan, the uh, Araman, the opposer from Zoroastrianism. And, and isn't uh, Satan just the adversary? I don't know. Let me. Oh bounce yes, it over he's to the Lucian. adversary. He's the accuser. He's the opposer. And what I what I particularly like about this is, and you find this in the Bible, you know, when when Satan argues with Jesus, right? And so it's, it's, Satan is trying to make uh, is trying to dissuade Jesus from making these assertions that are that are not evidently true, right? So so Satan is just trying to get Jesus to be honest, is the way I I interpret this. But of course, the way that they write it out in the Bible is not a rational argument, not not the sort of argument that a rational person would make. Satan is trying to negotiate with Jesus. You know, I'll give you all the kingdoms if you'll renounce God. Well, we know that that's not a we not that's that's not a rational argument to make. But Satan takes Jesus to the the top of a high mountain where he can see all of the kingdoms of the world because they thought it was flat, right? Uh, it, it, Satan as a character is is the person who embodies reason against faith. So faith is asserting things that are not evidently true and you're going to believe it anyway right so that's basically lying so and the lord of lies is the one who actually cares about the truth and and says that you should not say things that you cannot show the truth of it you shouldn't say things are true if you can't show the truth of it so so satan is the more honest character yet he's considered the lord of lies and and god is a liar even in the bible and i'm going to make a video about that soon and yet, yet God is supposed to be the ultimate truth, and Jesus is the truth. Why? Why is he the truth with a capital T? Because it's all a lie, and every lie is cast that way. Lucian Greaves, you want to jump in on our perception of Satan? Yeah, there there are some great histories that talk about the imagery of Satan and how that evolved, and how some of it came from racist perspectives of other people, the colors of the skin, uh, uh uh, images from uh, of like the prototypical Jewish person incorporated into the image of Satan, similar to Nosferatu and things like that. But sometimes I feel like delving into the finer details of the history of the literary evolution of Satan obscures the larger point. Like when some of our opposition look and they they say, well, Satan, who are they really worshiping? And then they look into obscure texts and tell us this is the the, tr the truth about, about Satan. I don't see throughout this literary history that there is a single truth to who Satan is. To a certain degree, it becomes an archetype, the opposition of 
the unified one, the God that is supposed to command us all, be omniscient, and and command our lives and morality and other such things. And now Satan is kind of this intuitive archetype of independent thinking and liberation for those who identify as Satanists, rather than a, a kind of uh, adherence to a specific literary character in specific quotes, necessarily from uh, Revolt of the Angels or Paradise Lost or anything else. I think without having that historical context, without reading the Bible from Isaiah on and seeing how God kind of uh, divides from being the author of darkness and light, the author of good and evil, into a more Zoroastrian conception of being all good in opposition to the ultimate evil on the other side. Um, I think the context that we're in now, the the rise of theocracy in the United States and our efforts to import it through, throughout the world, give people a real intuitive sense of the value of Satanism. And that's why our numbers have grown so significantly throughout time, even being, you know, part of uh, one of the most denigrated religious titles of all time. Shalise, I'm going to come to you in just a second, but let me follow up with Lucian. Do you think, though, that there's utility if we reverse engineer our notions of Satan, which exposes that this idea is man-made or human-made? I mean, there is utility in that, right? If you if you backtrack, oh yeah, you know, like, I I think there's particular utility in looking at that imagery and seeing how it was often called together from unjust denigrations of other peoples. Uh, just just to just to understand that and get past that, and real you can then realize that the harm that kind of thinking does, that kind of othering, that kind of making of pariahs of people, and in in putting a kind of composite image of Satan upon it. It's never served us towards any positive end. And I think, you know, at its best, secular interpretations that argue against Satanism will say that it's needlessly provocative, but we don't see it that way. I, I honestly think that if people could see it for what it is, could see the damage that that kind of othering does, they would see that there's actually something noble in what we're doing and trying to redeem the name of Satan, as ridiculous as that may sound to them. Uh, Shalise Blythe, uh, I don't know, big head, horns, white fanged teeth, pointy tail, Satan. I don't know. Uh, what's your take on all this? The, the the icon of Satan that most people think about, you know, it, it it it's evolved over time. I mean, even even the character of Satan has evolved from its origins of you know what what Satan was even in Abrahamic religions. So you know, it goes from the the archangel that was actually working in tandem or at the behest of God um, as the accuser, the the one who was actually delving out the accusations to those, and uh, you know, and and you know, with that comes with justice, justice, quote unquote. Um, and then over the years, Satan has then become uh, a caricature of what people deem evil, uh, depending on when you're talking about. So what was deemed evil, what was deemed other um, over the course of human history looks different. And a lot of the um, when people think of, you know, pop culture, Satan. Yeah. Like you said, the red skin, the horns, the you know, the the very animalistic traits that are usually um, associated with Satan comes from what people have placed upon as being negative attributes of those who have been over uh, othered over the years. Um, and even what Satan represents to self-identified Satanists tends to uh, um, differ over time. So even in Satanism, which as a religious identity didn't even exist until the 1960s, right? What Satan represents as um, an icon or, um, uh, you know, how we conceptualize whether it's the romantic Satanist, the metonic Satanist, um, those who see more, you know, beauty and ethereal, um, where other Satanists associate Satan with more, you know, animalistic carnal traits. Um, even that, it, you know, differs with, um, you know, within Satanism. But yeah, I, I think pop culture, what people tend to associate Satan with, generally speaking, um, yeah, I, I, it's just carryovers from the, the negative <clears throat> attributes that people put upon the others over the years. I, I've done some writing about uh, 
a dissonance, a feeling of discomfort. Uh, there was a, a tritone chord that uh, heavy metal bands love to use called the tritone. And there's something about it that makes people uncomfortable because the notes aren't harmonic in a comfortable way. And I feel like maybe that relates to so much of the rest of the culture of people who are programmed or maybe even evolved to see something serpentine or, or, you know, something that is foreign or, or just gives them the willies. Therefore it must be demonic. I don't know. Would you agree, disagree with any of that? Anybody? Sounds good to me. Okay. Well, just... For whatever reason, seeing something serpentine never bothered me. <laughs> well, you've how many snakes do you have? Twenty six. All right, hang at on the moment, but I, I but technically it's really thirty because Aaron got... tweets this. He says there is a venomous snake in my house and I can't find it. It's loose. <laughs> what the hell, Aaron? <laughs> and so I follow up and say what. You keep venomous snakes and it got out. And your response was, well, it's not that venomous. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What kind of snake? <laughs> it was a false water cobra, but it's a false water cobra. When I don't know, whatever. I mean, honestly, I'm I'm all good. I like it. If, if reptiles ring your bell, knock yourself out. Anybody else struck by the fact that all the uh, Christians, yeah, you know, the, the, Ron DeSantis and the Greg Abbotts and the Marjorie Taylor Greens, everybody freaking out about the devil. Your local pastor, they're all wigged out about 666, the Antichrist, the beast, and they're always <laughs> losing their minds. And yet these things must happen according to the Christian scriptures in order for God's plan to be fulfilled. So they're losing their minds and terrified over something that is actually preordained and must happen before they see heaven has anybody else gone down that rabbit hole anybody well people go down that rabbit hole for us and <laughs> you know fortunately for me there's uh you know especially amongst uh islamists there's uh, the legend of the antichrist who's going to uh who's going to arise who has a uh a scarred over right eye just like myself. So occasionally we see YouTube videos pop up about that or, or an upsurge in some kind of interest in, in that. And that that's always fun. People put together the pieces for you. Since you've been on Fox News, Tucker Carlson, et cetera, you ever get recognized out there? Holy shit, it's the Satanist from Fox News or wherever. That ever happened? Yeah, all the time. I guess I'm just I it maybe it is the eye thing or whatever, but I think people see me one time they're, they're going to recognize me a, a year year more later. So You ever fear for your safety? You're a high-profile satanist in a wackadoodle Christian nationalist satanic panic culture. You ever think yeah, Holy every, shit. every day I don't even I don't even have friends over my place. Wow. Cuz I worry they'll tell you know, they not that they'll do it intentionally, but pretty soon everybody will know where I am and I'll have to move or again or whatever. It's uh half the time I feel like I'm in the witness relocation program at this point. Yeah, I have a I have a slightly different perspective. Uh I, I feel that, you know, I'm I'm old. I've had a good run. I uh, I've made the most of life even when I was a dirt ass poor, which seems to be a perpetual situation for me. Uh, but I've done better than than anyone predicted that I would. My own family raised me with all kinds of negative reinforcement, telling me I'll never amount to anything. You know, my, my family, interestingly, we were all car carpenters, uh, and uh, and and all always told me that I, you know, I might be the world's greatest ditch digger, but I would have never amount to anything. They told me this as a child, and whatever happens to me, they can't take away what I've done beyond their expectations. So I can think of few better ways to die than as a martyr for what I actually believe in. And it's not just atheism is what I don't believe in. It's what I do believe in. I believe in, I believe in truth. And that means that I have to contest lies. And if I die for that cause, then that's a better way to go than a lot of other options. Well, like Satan, you, uh, you stood against repression, oppression, and tyranny. So hmm, that's interesting. More proof that are in worships satan but in texas <laughs> if you go out and stand on the street corner you're at standing at the corner of smith and wesson in texas 
let's say you had on a Satanism t-shirt. I know we're guessing. What do you think would happen? I've worn Satanist t-shirts in a number of different places. I, I hosted a satanic gathering at a Hungarian vampire bar, <laughs> you know, as you do uh, in, in downtown Dallas. Uh, and I, I don't have the fear of that because as I said, if, if somebody, if somebody were to, to, to violently attack me over that, all they can do is take my life. And at the, and, and at 60 years old, what are they, what are they doing? They're probably sparing me from, from months in cancer treatment or something like that. So, I mean, it, there are, there are certainly worse ways to go than for what you believe in. Wow. I don't know. Shalise, do you ever find yourself wanting to crawl from the front door to the car in the prone position? I mean, I don't know where you live now. Are you, are you in a Jesus area or something, anything? Or? Um, I mean, I'm in a very Catholic area. Um, okay. yeah, I'm no longer in Utah, but, um, I mean, I I am very realistic about, so when it comes to concerns about my safety, I consider myself very realistically aware of people wanting to make violent decisions about what their beliefs are of who I am, despite them being completely wrong. Um, when I was still living in Utah, I uh, I was running the one of the after-school Satan programs in one of the elementary schools. And uh, I had a family member who took a very serious um, offense to that. And uh, they decided to distribute my legal name and my address um, on the internet. So somebody had gotten that information and had shown up at my house uh, and their stated intent was to kill me. They had their nine millimeter. I had to call the cops. It was a whole thing. So that happened. And, uh, you know, I think my experience of being a public Satanist is, you know, the same experience I have being a, being a woman in this world, um, you know, the consequence the, the, the price I pay being a woman in this world is probably the same that I, I pay the price for for being a public Satanist. So when it comes to general safety, I mean, I'm very careful about making sure that um, uh, the effects of the decisions people make about whether or not they think I deserve to live or die doesn't impact those uh, around me, the people I care about, my family. Um, you know, and I, I have absolutely no intention of leaving this world that is, uh, you know, that is not on my own terms, but I also understand the world for what it is. Um, I don't accept it, but I understand what it is. So, I mean, if I, you know, kind of like what Aaron said, if I have to go into the ground because, uh, because somebody decides to take that violent action against me, well, at least I did something right. Uh, you know, and I didn't back down and I didn't shy away from my beliefs and, uh, you know, being very open about that. So, um, yeah, I don't want to be a martyr. I don't want to I don't want to die because of that. But, yeah. you know, it's just I, I've just accepted it for what it is. You've been generous with your time here on show number 666. Any final thoughts? I mean, I, we want to talk about the number. want to talk about Satan. You want to talk about your work. You want to talk about the culture. I uh, I'll just let you take whatever baton you're in the mood to take. Aaron Raw, I'll just start with you. I know you're never at a loss for words, and I mean that as a compliment. What are your final well, thoughts, brother? When when you read out the the line from the Bible, you ought to read the same version that Iron Maiden read out in their album Number of the Beast. Well shit, what is that? Now I gotta I gotta go find it or whatever. <laughs> I'll let you look it up. I'm I not will. gonna try I to will. emulate that now. I will. But uh, as far as you know, were you ever afraid of Satan? Like, did it ever bug you, Aaron? Did you ever come from that? I was accused. All? I was accused of being a devil worshiper the entire time. Every every time I ever questioned anything about the Bible, when I was, when I identified as Christian, when I thought of myself as a Christian, I was still being accused of being a devil worshiper. Were you afraid uh, of the devil though? When you identified as a Christian, I, I'm I'm very fortunate in that my family didn't believe a lot in hell. So I was raised by a mostly Mormon family, uh, and and hell and damnation was not their fixation. But that was the first thing that I had to reject when I was still a Christian, when I was still a child. I had to reject the notion of hell because hell is inconsistent with God. Uh, if God was, and I believed in God at this time, but but I I thought okay, if God and hell cannot both exist at the same time because one contradicts the other. Well, a benevolent God, perhaps. Certainly. Hell could any not God exist. worthy of worship, any God worthy of the of, of an ounce of respect would not allow a hell to exist. Because a malevolent deity could, you know, he could excuse, he could create an excuse hell like that. 
That's fair. Yeah. But what I realize that hell is just the ultimate excuse. It's the threat of a fate worse than death. It's, it's for the people who, if you spend two minutes thinking about heaven, you're going to see huge problems with it. My grandmother used to use the argument that in heaven, the, we'll all, the, the streets are made with, uh, paved with gold and we'll all live in mansions. And my first thought at, I don't know, 10 years old is why would we need shelter in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> but these are the thoughts one. that would never have entered my grandmother's mind. Well, right? The one so, I've always heard is it's uh, there's no pain or grief or sorrow in heaven whatsoever. And I'm like, well, if do you know that I'll be in hell screaming and roasting in unimaginable agony? And they're like, yes. Well, then in heaven, how could you ever experience perfect peace and no sorrow and pain knowing that was happening? And often what I get is, well, God wipes your brain, which yeah. means it's not you. It's somebody else. So exactly. uh, Shalice, any final thoughts on uh, what we've been talking about on the devil himself? Anything? Uh, well, you know, I've, I've, uh, oh, I've, I've often heard that the description of hell as being the absence of God. And all I can say is that I am, uh, I've never been more happy to be among the flames, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I have not felt more peace of mind and more, uh, more comfort in my, uh, in my authentic self than, than being a Satanist. And, uh, I'm, uh, glad I finally found my, found my coming home religion and finally found myself in it. I just want to say that when we went to Satan con, which was uh, a, an amusing thing to announce to my family that I was going to be a speaker at Satan Con. We went to uh, their their uh, satanic uh, ball, and I remember my wife, who was raised uh, both as a Catholic and as a Protestant, you know, by different sides of her family, each telling her that the other side is going to go to hell. And so she came from a very strong Christian background. She had the nightmares about hell and, and damnation and all that, that that she spent years trying to recover from. But I got to watch her, you know, embrace her her goth side as she entered the, the satanic ball and just just belong. And she 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 said, and this this had meaning for me when she walked into this the, the satanic ball and got to see all of the, the goth people and everything and listening to the kind of the you know, the, the metal rave kind of music that was playing at the moment that we walked in. And she says, I think I found my people. And it was hugely meaningful for me. She she got so much out of that, especially from the background that she did. I think there's an element of, I don't want to minimize what you're about, um, but there's an element of play to it. Like it, the things that terrify so many other people, they're sort of an aesthetic for uh, you know uh, this whole group over here it, it's sort of the window dressing it's it's theater and i know it's much more than that lucian greaves uh, i don't know does that sound insulting to non-theistic satanism if i say it that way i know it's to you much more right no i i think it, it's i think the more important message to put out to people is that they don't they don't have to like satan they don't have to like satanic imagery they don't have to like us i think too often when we're speaking, people uh, try to evaluate whether they find merit in our legal battles, in whether they agree with us, whether they find us reasonable, whether they find us likable. And sometimes they do, and that's great. But I think it shouldn't matter if we were the Communist Party, the Catholic League, Satanists, whomever else. <laughs> We shouldn't be allowing there to be the subjective latitude of politicians to denigrate an entire group based upon viewpoint from an unprincipled perspective that doesn't apply the law equally to all. And I think we really need to get back into that mindset where we recognize that even people we absolutely loathe have the same legal rights we do. And they only lose those rights when they stand outside of those legal boundaries and that we should protect those rights with everything we have or they're going to be lost for all of us. And I think that is the most important message the Satanic Temple can impress upon people now. That obviously resonated with Aaron's Hellhound, uh, which I think I heard barking mm -hmm. 
in the I background. so apologize that I didn't jump straight to the mute button, knowing that the dog is going to go off. No, no, not at all. I mean, I've got some critters here, and they love to make their presence as known. Shalice Blythe, R and Raw, Lucian Graves, thanks for helping me mark the day. Show number six six six. I mean, I came from a culture that programmed me to be afraid and. It's just amazing to be able to look at all this and not only not be afraid, but to say, hey, if it if it suits you, if you love it, if it's your aesthetic, if, you know, knock yourself out. Beyond that, I've actually come to see Satan as I know, um, was it Lucian who likes to say, uh, you frame Satan in the context of rebellion against tyranny. Am I misquoting you there? Is that accurate? No, nope, that is accurate. Yeah, I mean... Th- it was Satan who said, oh, this is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> you, know, you don't get to do this, Yahweh. And he formed a resistance. I kind of like that. And and it's been fun to embrace that in my own life. So thank you to all of you for helping me uh, celebrate the day. All my best in your endeavors. And let's talk again soon, okay? Thank, thank you so much. You.